The Brutally Speaking podcast is proudly sponsored by Starving Artist Brewing. Starving Artist Brewing may be a small speck on Michigan's beer map, but they say big things come in small packages. A brewery who really puts their money where their mouth is, supporting underground artists far and wide. Making delicious beers with the simple belief that you should judge beer, not people. Brutally Speaking Podcast is proudly sponsored by Rockabilia.com. For over 30 years, Rockabilia has been the go-to destination for all things band merch. With over 500,000 items in their online store and collaborations with today's hottest bands, you're sure to find something you love. Use our code BREW10 at checkout and take 10% off your total order. So go pick up your favorite new piece of merch now over at rockabilia.com. Now, on to the show. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Brutally Speaking Podcast. I am your host, John. And this episode's guest is the returning Sean Cooper of Taking Back Sunday. I was really excited to have him come back on. Really enjoyed our conversation uh, the last time when he was on to quote unquote promote the Stray Light Runs uh, live album at the time. And Taking Back Sunday at this point, uh, they have a new album that's out. And it is. Kind of wild uh, to, to think and to grow, I should say, uh, with bands. You know, I, I constantly think about how bands have evolved uh, over the years and kind of grown, I would say, more adjacent to me. But I guess in conjunction, I guess they have grown with me or I've grown with them. And Taking Back Sunday is one of those bands that, you know, I think a lot of people have certain eras, quote unquote, of the band that they're like, oh, I used to love Taking Back Sunday when I was, you know, in high school or just out of and and a young teen, early 20s. And, you know, they were the soundtrack to my summer, to all my trips and hangouts with my friends and all these adventures. And it gets kind of fun to kind of dissect that a little bit. Um, it's actually something I was talking about uh, with a few people, but uh, in a few weeks you'll hear me kind of talk that over with Porter uh, from Atreyu. And this kind of all came about, uh, and you'll hear more about this in that episode, but, uh, you know, I'm still... That's happening. <laughs> that will happen uh, in a few weeks, So, and I'm still kind of in my present. Uh, obviously, if you've heard me talk on the podcast, you know I kind of get fixated with time and, and these different circumstances around the art existence as people. And I've really been thinking a lot about, and I will say that it was partially spurned on by an acid trip that I went on, uh, this, this past weekend. And it's a thing where I really kind of started talking with one of my longtime friends the night before the trip, uh, two of my best friends that I've known for like almost 20 years now. And something we were kind of talking about was just different things uh, through our lives that have kind of set us on this path. We also kind of talked about uh, the us that not everyone gets to see, uh, which is what solidifies the friendship and the relationships that we have with certain people, uh, but also kind of coming to the realization that it's okay to have acquaintances and so on and so forth. Uh, and that obviously was something that was discussed in last week's episode with Telly uh, from The Word Alive. And so I just kind of really been thinking about this idea of existence in different situations for, from different vantage points, I guess, even. And something I've really been wrestling with is just the idea that you, you can exist f- in someone's mind a certain way for maybe, and you only knew this or hung out with this person for like a year or two. And that is all the memory and all the the recollections and everything that they have and, and, and formed how they still think of you, however many years, decades have gone on since. And I kind of start thinking about that from a band's perspective where a lot of people will be like, you know, in, a, in, in an instance of Taking Back Sunday, oh, I only really like the band on like Tell All Your Friends or Where You Want to Be or Louder Now or whatever, whatever the record is that maybe is your like, your safe space of sorts where it's like, I go here, it's comfort food. It it gives me this thing that I can't get anywhere else. 
But it's kind of weird to think that like that you only see those people existing in that time frame. And what does that do to a person? How do you navigate the space of having to, I guess, exist in this person's mind, knowing that you have moved on and are a completely different person, hopefully, since then, but still also giving credence that that experience for that person and, and the side of you at that point that that person knows is also still valid. Um, I know that that probably sounds like a very like trippy way out there. Like, of course you were on drugs when you thought of this, but I do think it just, it allows us to kind of, or allows me, I should say, it allows me to look at things from a different perspective than maybe my own. And it's those kind of thoughts that I think allow me to, I guess, understand maybe how I need to change for the betterment of myself. Uh, maybe, being able to communicate with someone that doesn't have a full grasp on who I am, like in the current time. Um, but I think about that on, on such a bigger scale with a lot of the guests that I talk to, because it's like you, you have been in the public eye for so long. And the sentiment always is sometimes with some of the bands that have been around for, you know, 10, 20 years. Oh, I didn't know you were still in a band. I didn't know you were still doing a thing. I did. How many records have you put out since whatever the record is that that person identifies you with? And it's just such an interesting, it's just such an interesting thing to think of for me. Um, we'll kind of delve more into that, and in, in, like I said, in the Porter chat, because we kind of get into that. But it is still something that's very present on my mind, uh, just given the fact that it has kind of permeated into a handful of my conversations, uh, both on the podcast and in you know my personal life. So, food for thought. Think about it a little bit. Think about. I guess that's a, a fun place I'll leave it off at before we get into my conversation with Sean. Who are you versus who people think you are? And which is the more accurate de depiction of you? I think you might be surprised if you really sit down with that thought and think about that. Without further ado, though, here is my conversation with Sean, and I'll talk to you on the other side of it. Uh, well, I'll get going because I know you have to be done relatively quickly. <laughs> wild day, wild day. Good fun, though. I mean, <laughs> I was saying to my wife earlier, because uh, we're getting doors measured to get new doors here pretty soon, and I was like, I am, like, very excited to get new doors. <laughs> and I was like, the things that become important. Yeah, I mean, I just like turned 39 uh, like two weeks ago or so, and I was like, I guess 39 is the year like shit changes. Like we went to Milwaukee uh, a couple of weeks or about the same time frame, um, and I picked out some novelty t-shirts like that were kind of cool, like, like a little thrift shop thing. And I go, <clears throat> you know, and I've always said and joked with my wife, I go, at what age as an adult do you go, I need to buy this t-shirt to commemorate this, this stupid place I went to? <laughs> And I go, apparently right there with you. where you get super stoked about novelty t-shirts to be like, I was at this place on a vacation and now I'm here. And it is like the peak of my day at this point, my week even maybe. Yeah, man. I hear you. Um, <clears throat> it's a, uh, so I kind of wanted to, to jump on something cause I haven't, I don't think you guys collectively have done much uh, press since dropping the video for uh, sold. Um, were you, were you surprised to see the like almost viralness, at least on Twitter, of people being like, guys, Taking Back Sunday is playing a fucking house show. Like, could you have imagined better promo for the hype around basically a new single and a new record other than playing basically a house show for a music video? Yeah, we, we couldn't believe it. Um, our, our drummer, Mark, had the idea to kind of have that vibe for the for the the song and, and for that video. And then uh, we, we shot the video and then we played we played a show. So it was all all absolutely legitimate on the level. And I did not 
imagine like I, I was so happy that that it actually connected and and made people excited and then the video came out not too long after the it went viral like with this with this record cycle we've been able to shoot the videos very close to when they came out so there was there was kind of that hype building and then it was yeah out in the world so it was a really an amazing thing it was very cool i think what's kind of wild is you know thinking about that <clears throat> I know when I saw the video, I was like, or saw the, the tease of the video, I was like, oh man, like, because I had just seen the Foo Fighters, like mini documentary of them picking like house shows and yeah. playing at these people's places. And I was like, you know, there are certain bands that I think could kind of do it and it wouldn't feel like disingenuous for lack of a better term. Like it would seem like it would be who they still are. And I feel like you guys would be that and like i kind of was interested in seeing more of like that like the end of the video where you guys are just kind of reminiscing at the end of the everything and i was like i feel like there could be more to that um that could happen and it would feel very like i said genuine and it, it doesn't it's not like oh these are people just putting on a front just for the sake of you know a music video or whatever like i think you guys could do something like that and it would not feel weird or not feel like you wouldn't do that you know almost what th shit 30 years now collectively i think uh being in tbs yeah yeah getting getting close but yeah yeah i mean but like that's the thing we've done we've done things like uh at, at a, a local bar called the inn we just we we had a rehearsal that day before tour we went to the small bar and, and played and had people come out and it was just wild so it's like something we just do organically anyway so and we love talking about it after because it makes us feel so good and that's why we keep doing stuff like that it's just it's just really fun and a different way to to reconnect with where we came from so yeah i'm all about it i mean how important is that to you i mean something something i've kind of talked about a little bit on this show but i mean just, i think just in general as you get older and kind of look back i think you kind of try to reconnect to who you maybe were and kind of look back on the journey of where you are now and and kind of maybe i don't want to necessarily put words in your mouth and say rediscovering the why but i feel like there has to be sort of a check-in at points where you're like this is why i do it this is like remember these things and now we're here or things haven't changed and we're the, still the same people yeah, I think I think there's a lot to be said for that, and I, I think it's like an interesting place where we all kind of are as as people and as parents, especially. My kids are a little bit older now than you know a few years ago. Like my focus was all about the band and taking care of very young kids. Now the kids are kind of doing their own thing; they're at school all day long. So I definitely have a little more time to to kind of focus on on different aspects of my life like that so it it is really fun now that i have the time to kind of reconnect and recalibrate and see and then and, and like realize the band's been pretty successful for a good long time and and the very humble beginnings and not really thinking this band was going to be anything i i we did it for fun we did it because we loved it we did it because we loved creating with each other and that that's continued on you know and and we we've been adam says it all the time we're the luckiest guys we know because we still get to do this really, really fun thing for our job and, and make it a career, which, you know, I always feel like we're on borrowed time. Like, how do how do we, how is it that we've gotten so lucky we get to continue to do this? So it is nice to, to think about that in those early days and, and just doing it for the love of it entirely. And because that's still a huge part of it. Well, I think that the thing that kind of struck me and kind of made me, interestingly, look at the record maybe a little bit differently than others because sometimes i i feel like getting these records ahead of time with like the press bios and all that kind of stuff is is interesting because it's sort of curated in many interviews with all of you in conjunction to the record and what makes it you know something that you know maybe we want to have someone on and discuss but when listening to it, it like it's to me sounds a little bit different it sounds somehow oddly nostalgic but also fresh and something that i thought was interesting in the presser bio was how it was talking about how you guys all kind of changed sort of how you write a record like this was kind of more like here's an idea that's great but what if we did this and kind of changed how you wrote as a collective and it's kind of again maybe it's just kind of getting older and thinking about things differently but finding a, a new way to do the same thing and kind of making things fresh and interesting for you. And I don't know if you've really gotten to talk at length about the process of writing this record from this new new perspective, but how was that? And was, was it a little bit challenging maybe? Well, it's always challenging. It's always it's always challenging to kind of like distill the best ideas 
and and figure it out and you're working as a collaborative four piece and then add in, in the producer so you have a lot of different voices and stuff and and making choices uh, um like with with the consensus in mind so so it's never it's never easy but it is always fun and really rewarding i think um with this record we 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 learned a lot from the writing of tidal wave whereas sometimes we'd overthink things in the past pre tidal wave we were we learned to really trust our gut and and not to to think we should take things in a different direction than when where they're naturally headed. Like I, I use the song title in the title track as a good example. That was written as a kind of folky song by John. And then Mark, our drummer, was like, "Man, what if we just sped it up?" And he starts playing the beat that opens up that song, and we all just went, "Yup." Like, is that a little too Ramones? Is that a little too clashy? Don't care. It's awesome. Go for it. So we took that kind of mentality into the writing of the one five two record. Plus. You know, whatever our pop sensibilities have become now um, and working with Tushar Apti, our producer, um, he was he was so instrumental in, in funneling these ideas through his filter. And a lot of the songs um, didn't didn't change too much arrangement wise, like maybe they got whittled down or, or you know, a, a couple of rearrangement things. But he was just so good at at adding layers of sound, adding textures that, that kind of changed the sound is responsible for sonically how, what you're hearing. And we, we worked with him when uh, we did a song with uh, producer Steve Aoki, DJ, mega, mega star, awesome dude. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we just said, man, we got to work with this guy, the way he works, the way he moves things in or, around in the computer. He, he's just so musically talented and he is just such an ear and he understands what we do. He understands what each of us brings to the table almost immediately. So, so he just brought so much to the table and we were so lucky we got to, to use him and work with him. I, <clears throat> so it's something you just said, it's kind of interesting to, to think about it, you know, the way that he's able to move things in the computer. And I feel like yeah. anymore, some people would almost maybe say that's a detriment. Like that, that's, it's not music really. It's, you know, the sort of what we were saying earlier of like, you know, getting in a room and, and jamming and kind of, kind of coming with ideas and, and building something organically but then you're saying like it's also how you can manipulate something when it's sort of pieces and and unlocking something there i think is interesting because i would say there's there might be um some people from your same like age range like the tenure of band that might go that's not how we do it and are missing opportunities to maybe actually find themselves again in a creative space because they're again, just kind of doing the same thing over and over and over again versus understanding that the times have changed and you kind of need to as well. Yeah, yeah. And a big thing, like when I say that, it's like, okay, let, let, what would happen if we trimmed this, this part down by four bars? Or what happens if that chorus is actually the bridge and then the bridge is really the chorus? Let's move that around and see, and then we'll go play it in real time. So it's like the, the fastest editing you could ever imagine to hear the ideas back in real time. Otherwise, we'd have to all go back in the room, which we've done a million times, and have to re-record it. Up, oh, someone messed that up. It's going to take two hours to e get everyone on the same page and to try all these different ideas. And then it's like, wait, is that even better than the original thing? Then you got to pull up the original session and see where we're at. And so, so that it was like it was getting to do all the, the same things, but in, in at warp speed. So, so that was mm. a really, really fun process with him. Well, I think that's the one thing that sort of technology has afforded everybody is to. I just feel like it makes it to where it's like, why not try something? Because it it, it kind of doesn't yeah. take time in the grand sense of, of the word of like, like you just said, I don't have to go into the room, kind of remember how to how to play it the way we're talking about and then moving things around and yeah. doing stuff. It's like, I can just take this section, snip it, move it over here. Does that work? Yep. No. Yeah. Okay, now we move on. And I feel like it just frees up more time to be creative um and and kind of like yeah. you said, put your best foot forward so it's funny to me that people kind of don't adopt technology in that sense and kind of look at it as more of a hindrance than a something that's a positive yeah i mean i guess i guess to each their own and, and whatever works for you and stuff you know like art's hard enough so i'm not going to knock anyone for doing it <laughs> they're being stuck in their ways i just i just know what works for us so and, and i feel really good about the results you know something else that was kind of interesting uh i remember when the the album title came out and i was i think at least for me a lot of people were like and it was good to be reaffirmed uh because i was like i feel like they've made reference to that on pretty much every album cover but then i started second guessing myself because i was like 
well, where was it on the like you know on tidal wave i was like where was it on tidal yeah. wave and like you know i'm trying to think in my head like has it always been on all of them i think it has been um so it was kind of cool to to sort of see that there's been this this continuity sort of throughout everything but it's one of those that it feels like a very easter eggy type thing uh that you don't necessarily draw attention to but it's always been there so uh you know how was it to kind of just put it on front street this time and just be like it here it is and why now yeah like yeah, yeah, and and so that that was the thing, and I'll give the backstory behind it. It's a it, it was an exit in North Carolina where Adam, our singer, would meet up with friends who were meeting up from all over the state, and they'd take that exit and then go to go to shows in different areas together, and uh, and so it was something he he was passionate about from the very start of the band that he wanted to represent those friends and and missing them because he moved up to Long Island to to do the band. So so it was a thing he had worked into all of the album covers as an homage to that kind of time in his life. And I thought that, that was a really sweet thing. Then as this record was was getting put together and we were hearing what it was and we were listening back and we were thinking of a song title, it just kept coming to us. I, I think this is it. You know, we don't want to do a self-titled record, but what represents the band best right now in this moment? And it's the one five two. And Adam was the most hesitant to title it that. He's like, I don't know, <laughs> what if what about this? What about the other? Like, what if we take a song title and the other three of us went, man, one five two, it just it just feels right. So, um, so we just trusted our gut with it and, and I feel, I feel great about it. Well, I feel like almost to a degree, one, five, two is almost like a, a self-titling it in, in essence. Cause I mean, it's yeah. sort of the impetus of the band. So it sort of is kind of going back to the beginning. It is who you are. It is everything. And yeah, I don't 100%. know. It's one of those things like. I, I just find like those kind of things is like, uh, and I don't know if, and this sounds like it's such an old man, get off my lawn type thing, but I don't know if like there is sort of that, those like Easter eggs, that continuity thing, like, you know, Kevin Smith movies were always great. And I loved like all the little Easter eggs you'd find where it's like, oh, this person was a character they referenced in like clerks. And now he's popping. Now he's actually popping up in mall rats. Oh, this event, this person who died is actually what set up the funeral that you saw in clerks and then moving forward through all the other movies in his yeah. like little world he created. And it's one of those where it's like for those people who want to go deeper and further and invest more time with the art, with the person and the people, it kind of creates this just a sort of sense of community and so forth and just kind of rewards the, the fandom, I guess, or just the willingness to go so deep with it. So to me, like seeing these kind of things, I think is really rewarding all these years later to kind of like the big payoff of sorts. And I just, uh, I don't know, maybe it's because bands don't necessarily always get the opportunity to have this long of a career as you all have gotten to, to do these things. Maybe they don't have the intention to kind of think that far in advance or whatever, or maybe even the fans just don't care as much as maybe those of, you know, almost 40s and older would and so to me it's one of those things where it's just this like really unique perfect storm of art and fandom and all this kind of stuff kind of merging together on this record for like with the album title and so forth and uh just kind of a nice payoff yeah and and with us we were just kind of trusting where the universe was pointing us you know from the songs to the title to the artwork to you know um We've, we've had our, our friend DJ Bronner directing all of the videos and, and he's like, we've hired him as our creative director for everything. So he took the album cover uh, picture, took, you know, all, all the, all the things that are on the album. He's directing all of the videos he's, and we've worked with him on tying everything together and, and connecting everything. And uh, it's just been such a great process that we really paid a lot of attention to this time around. Is kind of segueing off of the band, but kind of going more to you personally. Is that something that you pay a lot of attention to in your own life? A lot of like seren quote unquote serendipitous moments, things that seemingly when you start paying attention, you're like, this is happening quite a bit. I wonder if like the universe is trying to point me in a direction or telling me something. Well, I like to... I like to embrace whatever direction the, the, the world is taking me until there's a problem. So like w w whether it's like the, the schools my kids go to or, or, you know, any of these things, like if random things pop up, if I have a problem, I'm going to voice it. But if not, I'm just going to embrace it. Oh, my kid's in a certain class and I don't know if he's going to like that teacher. Like, do I need to raise this think about it now or am I going to wait to see if it's, it's going to be actually a really good thing? So I'm more like a, a wait and see. And, and let's, let's go and let's not, let's not put our, our heels in the sand 
until we need to. <laughs> so, so yeah, I'm definitely kind of, kind of that, like go with the flow, figure it out. Is this working? Is, is this going to be better than, than I ever imagined it was because I was trusting someone else's direction with, with something and, you know, it happens to us creatively all of the time. Like, I don't know what this idea is. Like if Adam brings an idea to the band about a, a music video or a song or something, I'm not, like, I trust this guy. I'm going to see where he's going to bring this. And if I don't like it, I'm going to voice it later, but I'm going to let him see it through until that point. And maybe I'm not seeing big picture yet. Maybe there's some ideas clouding my head or I have a preconceived idea that's not exactly right. So, so show me, show me the way. And then, and then we'll talk when we get to that place. I feel like at times that <clears throat> it's so weird, like kind of speaking of things happening and just being in tune to them when they do, I was actually just kind of speaking to this earlier today with a coworker where I was like, you know, sometimes I think we as people are too quick to, to judge something and just not trust that like whatever is going to happen will, will be good. Um, we just have this idea that like <clears throat> when you hear something, it's like, well, that's not going to be good. It won't work. It, you know, you're just going to shoot it down too quickly. <clears throat> and a lot of times I find that sometimes the, the cooler things for other people, seeing other people's successes, whatever your own things, your own experiences is kind of when you just let go for a minute and just kind of see where things go. And, you know, I think, uh, I think it was Craig Reynolds from straight from the path. Um, he had a, and I agree with the sentiment, both in the sentiment and also just the metaphor of it, but he was talking about, uh, he had a tweet that was like, people should do, uh, like mushrooms because, you should be a passenger in your life more often sometimes instead of driving all the time. And essentially right, right. I think there's a lot of people who can't let go of the control like that and just kind of go, let's just see where this goes. I have faith in that this will lead me somewhere and I'm just going to enjoy the journey. And ultimately that's going to be a positive experience than trying to force something or stopping something from happening. And I think that's, again, I don't know if that's just a, something that I, you come to as you get older where you're like, all right, I have a built a built in trust that I've come to with this person, this thing, this whatever, this experience. I'm just gonna see where this goes. Yeah, and I think I think a big thing where the the waters kind of got muddied for me for you know probably a bunch of years. Like I don't I don't really know when I started to to come around on it, but I think uh, becoming a parent it was a big thing. Like there are certain things that are black and white. Your kid runs out in the street. <laughs> it's very, very dangerous. So you have to really control those things. So I feel like I, I probably got very controlling in a lot of different aspects of my life that it, where it was unhealthy because I was so focused on, on raising children and keeping them safe and protecting them and doing the things. But it's like, you don't need to take care of your friends or, you know, or, or coworkers or anything like you do your children. You can, you can give them space to breathe and everyone's kind of going to live and die by their own choices. So I think that, that that's definitely something to, so, but as, as my kids have gotten older and I've had to let them make their own mistakes and make their own choices, I go, I can, I can let everybody do that. And I'm either going to deal with the consequences. I can help them pick up the pieces if something, something bad has happened, but I need to let them come to me for help. I can't just keep volunteering because I'm going to become a nag. I'm going to be really annoying. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be more aware of that in, in all the facets of my life. It's really interesting. And it's one that when you say it, you're just like, well, of course, but I mean, even me without having kids, like times I, I, yeah. I had to kind of come to that same mentality, that same idea, like going through therapy and stuff where it's like, okay, I can't solve all these what ifs I can't because they're not, they're not happening. So instead I just kind yeah. of need to let things happen, deal with whatever is currently happening with the information I have and then move forward. And when you kind of wow. have that realization that you, you can't overanalyze and just overthink everything to death and just kind of have to deal with what is, I got to say, man, life's been a lot more rewarding when you're just kind of in the moment. And I feel like having kids like because a lot of my friends have kids like by proximity, see this a lot where it's yeah. like, yeah, seeing seeing people, seeing children go from these things where they can't communicate, can't do anything and then be people seeing how they their brains work and coming up with ideas and stuff is so interesting and it's kind of a thing where i've been thinking a lot more about like where does the innocence of being allowed to have that freedom to to fail and wonder where does it stop and why do we why do we lose it as adults and it's something i've been thinking about and i, I could be wrong i think um a lot of people don't explore new areas. I think they get in their comfort zone, whether it's like 
just sticking to playing video games or, you know, like you, you stick to your regular work, workout routine, like you're not learning anything new. So you're not really branching out. You're not allowing yourself to fail. Your ego can really take over and you're afraid to look foolish because, oh, I'm old, I'm established, you know, I, I have all this money and I own multiple properties. So I can't, I can't, uh, you know, try to ride a unicycle or something like that. You know, um, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm too, I'm too important for that. It's like, no, you're not. And uh, you're going to stifle yourself. <laughs> you're going to stifle your growth. If you're not explaining these things that you might want to try, you know, like, like, and it, for different people, you know, maybe they never picked up an instrument, but always wanted to. Now they might have the time. They might have the money, like go, go and do that. Go take lessons, be worse than a, a 10, 10 year old, you know, that's what's going to happen, but it's really healthy for your growth. So I think that a lot of people stagnate that way. And I try not to, I try to, I try to branch out in different areas and look like a fool and also not be afraid of, of looking foolish doing anything. Well, I was talking to a friend of mine that I just had on the show and, you know, he, the time I had had him on previously, like he had, you know, the band kind of had gotten off the road. The late, they had been dropped by the label. They just, you know, everything kind of stopped just due to where they were in their life. And now, you know, the band's kind of getting ready to reunite and go do some shows, uh, a couple of shows here and there. And nice. it's been kind of funny. Cause as, as I was talking to him, I was like, you know, you, I see you like, through social media and so forth and just knowing you like your daughter's like getting into like sports and your kid you know your son's a little bit older and kind of getting into things does seeing them push themselves and challenge themselves into new things does it give you i don't want to say the permission but does it give you maybe the inspiration to be like all right well this band i was doing is is fine and like that's one outlet for me but now i have I other thing it gives me the permission to try to do something putting myself out there in a way that I wouldn't have before does your kids kind of do that for you because I feel like like I said when you see someone kind of becoming this thing and trying and being supportive and all that kind of stuff I feel like it it can't not rub off on you as an adult even yeah I mean like like th there's so many intimidating things about being a parent like I was teaching my daughter how to ride a bike <laughs> and I taught her older brother how to how to ride a bike three years prior but I didn't know how to teach someone how to ride a two-wheeler. Two I only knew <laughs> how, how I learned, to holding the seat and going. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to watch YouTube videos and become an expert in teaching my kids how mm. to ride a bike. And my daughter learned much quicker than my son because I had more knowledge. I, I had done it. But like that was a, a skill I, I needed to learn. And um, it, what was I thinking? There's something else. I was playing catch with my son. I hadn't, I hadn't had a baseball mitt on my hand since I was like seven years old. So when he was about mm. three, I got him a mitt. I bought me a mitt. I'm like, I need to learn how to catch a ball again. This is going to look really <laughs> silly for a guy in his, in his <laughs> late thirties to learn how to do again. And I was so intimidated. Anytime we'd go to the field and, and play catch and like everybody on the field is better than me. I'm like, all right, but this is what I'm doing. Cause it's important to my kid. I want to give him this experience of playing catch with his dad. Now we play all the time. I'm decent. I can catch his, his nine year old, throws no problem but uh <laughs> you know but but you know i i had to i had to embrace that and say hey man this is okay this is okay you're not like you're and and now we have a nice time we just sit in the backyard and we have a chat while we're throwing the ball around it's a it's a wonderful thing but yeah i was i wasn't very i wasn't very capable a couple of years ago odd question have uh i think you just said your son's nine now so if there was like a yeah. technically a three-year gap i assume your daughter's six ish yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So they're at the age now, by all accounts, where these are the memories that they'll kind of be able to have cognitively when they're like our age. Have they? I would assume that they've seen you, you guys play, right at this point now, yeah. live. How has yeah, that yeah, been lots. to kind of experience experience that? It's really cool because what's so what's so great about them is that they love seeing me do it. They love hanging out with the crew and I like, talk with all the guys and stuff and, and watching the show and kind of knowing what everyone does. But then they get sick of it so fast. They get <laughs> sick of the travel. Like, you know, they'll, they'll come to like two or three shows on a tour tops. And then they're like, we got to go home. I need my own bed. I'm sick of this hotel. I'm sick of the DoorDash orders or whatever. I'm sick of the catering backstage. Like, you don't know. When I was your age, I would have killed to be backstage at any band show. Like I was a huge Guns N' Roses fan when I was like seven years old. I was like, they have a backstage. It's got to be magical. It's got to be crazy. And here you are just sitting here. And and uh, and so it's like, it's one of those things. Like they, they, I think they have the perfect understanding of it. Like, yeah, it's really, really cool in small doses. 
I have sort of done the same with my wife. Uh, she through doing this podcast and just having friends who tour and so forth in different capacities, um, have gotten yeah. to spend a lot of time with different people. But it was kind of funny because like a couple weeks ago, the Atreya dudes were here in town and we brought our dog to come hang out with them and so forth. And as we were leaving, she was like, "So they just like sit in this room all day?" And I was like, "Yeah." Plus, <laughs> and then she's like, "That's it." Uh, I was like, yeah, no, I mean, like, that's that's why, like, I try to, that's why I will try to go out of my way when I know someone's coming to town and, like, hang out, because then I can be, or I'll offer, like, you and I to go take them somewhere, because I'm like, yeah, I'm sure you've never gone to this thing or eaten here or done anything, because you only know probably, like, the block radius around a venue or the bus, and I was like, that sucks, so I was like, it's it's a thing where sometimes understanding that I think goes a long way, where you're like, touring can be fun, but it's also really redundant. It's Groundhog Day, basically. <laughs> yeah, man. Like, and it's and, and let me form. tell you, man. <laughs> I, I get pumped anytime a dog is hanging out backstage. I get so excited. Like that brightens my day. Friendly little pup to <laughs> wrestle around with is just—it's the best. So that, that's a huge highlight. So you did them a service. That's awesome. Oh, absolutely. Well, it's funny. We were joking as we were taking her because we're still getting our like she Frankie's not super. She will get in the car now after having her for like four years. She'll get in the car now, nice. but she still doesn't really enjoy it. Um, so it was the thing where as we were going, we're like, you're going to be a therapy dog for a little bit today. Like, you don't know it, but everyone's going to want to come and pet you. And you're just going to be exhausted at the end of the day, which is great for us. It's almost <laughs> like having a child. Where so you're like, attention. All right, go to this thing and just run around and get exhausted. And then for the rest of the night, you're just going to zonk out and it's going to be great. Um, yeah, but man. it's a thing where she did really good with it. And now I'm just kind of like, I was telling another friend that was here in town. Uh, I was like, well, you'll be back in a couple of weeks. So I was like, I'll bring the dog. And he's like, absolutely. Please do. <laughs> yeah. It's so I think the dog, everyone great. likes the dog more than me probably at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but they know she can't get there without you unless they you know, do one of no. the Ubers for dogs or something. Is that a thing? I don't think I've ever heard of that. I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I don't <laughs> like, think so. I think, I think, I think, <laughs> Yeah, I think I think there are like Ubers you could bring your dog in, but I don't I don't think they're allowed to ride solo. <laughs> I don't know. I saw that uh that video a while ago of the dog that just gets on the bus and then goes to like the beach or the park or something by itself, and everyone just knows that it does that. And you're like, that's cool. I don't know how you would even. I don't even know how the dog would know to do that. <laughs> Yeah, and there there was a that dog in Japan where they have this station where the, the dog would go to meet its owner every day at work and then uh, the owner passed away and the dog would still keep hanging there so now they have a statue commemorating that pup mm, i didn't know that yeah that i i would look that up but i feel like it would make me cry because i'd be like that's yeah really sad. yeah it's a beautiful sad story <laughs> um kind of last couple of things so i can let you go to get back to your kids since we've been talking so much about them um uh -huh. i mean Something I always I always find like it's got to be like the great challenge of, you know, I think this is what your eighth eighth album at this point. That's going to write. Yeah. LP8. Yeah, how do nice. you how how do you pick a set list? Because it's like you're I feel like inevitably you're going to let fans down one way or another, whether you you don't play something or you do. But then again, they, they didn't get to hear whatever. And they're going to be bummed if you don't play something. So it's like point eight albums in where there's you know obviously the singles and so forth of every record you determine like what ones like i mean at a certain point it's like can you get away with not playing you know something off of uh the first couple of records and be like look we already did anniversaries we played those records in full we haven't really gotten to celebrate the last like three or four in that kind of detail so we're going to kind of do that now. Like, are you at a stage where you think where you can do that and people aren't going to get upset? I Well, you know, you, someone's always complaining on the internet, but uh, <laughs> what true. we like to do. What, so, so that makes it like, you know, you're not so fearful. You're like, well, you know, no matter what we do, we're, we're screwed. So what, what we do is we know when we go to shows, we want to hear the hits that, that we love from, from the bands we love. So we're never going to exclude the, the big ones that we know most people respond to. But then we're going to take chances and we're going to work some other different different things in and hope people, we, we want people leaving feeling good. And it's always a party. You know, I feel like it's always feels like an event when we come to the town and we're always having such a good time up there. So like we're going to work in a lot of this record and we're doing these full album plays coming up in, uh, in November in New York and 
Los Angeles and Nashville. So like, that's how we kind of like, this is how we're going to celebrate the record and show everyone this record front to back. And I think, I think we want to do that more. Sometimes we're just going to do full album plays just for the hell of it because we can, and we want to keep those songs under our fingers and, and we love doing that. But like, we're always going to give you the hits. There's always going to be songs, you know, everyone in the crowd knows. Um, so we're not, it's not going to be like a, a whole B side show ever <laughs> and you know maybe as we get older too our shows will get longer like i don't know if we're gonna do like springsteen four hours at uh met life or something like that but you know maybe we'll get damn close to it i would even wonder because something else i think that was kind of that's been interesting of what the band has been doing is kind of mixed build and like I th i'm thinking right off the top of my head like when you guys did that uh every time i die tour uh yeah you know a lot of people probably looked at that and were like that doesn't go together meanwhile me being a fan of both bands i was like this is rad this is how shows used to be where it'd be like now throw in some random like hip-hop dude or something like that on there and it's like this is what the scene kind of was it wasn't just any one thing it was sort of a collection of everything and we all like kind of got to hear a lot of cool different stuff because of that so to me i wonder if that's like, something you're going to probably continue doing as well moving forward is kind of these mixed bills are kind of staying more in this is kind of a curated evening of sort of the same thing. Yeah. I mean, we, we always, we try to go with people we really like because it's so much better when we, we have people we enjoy being around those every time I die guys fit that bill hundred percent. And like, we, we like to keep it fun for ourselves. Like in, in 2019 on the, the final leg of, of the 20 year tour, we had red city radio out and I only knew those guys like kind of peripherally and, uh, and really got to know them on that tour. And they made every day so fun. They were just such a good energy to be around and they were always put on such a fun show. So like we like picking bands from what, whatever genre, like it, it doesn't really matter if you're cool people and you're fun to be around like that, that's paramount for us. And then, and so, yeah, so whatever genre that is, like, we're going to embrace it. Well, again, <laughs> kind of beating a dead horse on this thing, but I feel like that just kind oh, of yeah. comes with getting older where it's like, you just don't, I just don't think you care anymore. Like the things that seemingly people care about when you're younger, looking cool or whatever, you're like, I don't care about that. I just want to like have a good time. I want to like hang out with good and if that looks like X, Y, or Z, that's that's all that matters. Like I don't I don't care that like this is the band that we should be touring with because they sound just like us. It's like I don't care. Yeah, and 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 with us too, it's like if if we're friends with the band and we really like them, no matter what the genre is, we want to expose that band to, to more people. We want people to enjoy this because we do too. We think it'd be a good mix, no matter what. So yeah, so we're always always keeping that in mind to to keep it fun for ourselves and and to to keep people on their toes and we're not going to, you know, we we're, we're trying to play long sets. We don't want another band that sounds exactly <laughs> like us there. You know, it, it's not very interesting. A last question, because it, it seems like with, you know, kind of things being the same as in it's the band and you guys have been doing this for so long and kind of paying, you know, like we were talking about with the album title, um of kind of going back to the way things started and so forth it's like it seems like you guys have all been very aware and cognizant of how things have started where you're at now in your career has there been has there been talks of what an end could look like because i think that's also a, a not something you need to fixate on but i think there also needs to be the reality of understanding that things can't last forever and that there has to be yeah. what does it look like and ending things kind of when you know that they need to be have you have you as a collective have you guys had that conversation where it's like if it looks like this then maybe we should kind of maybe think about putting this to bed you know i think we're well aware that it could go and and, and from the very beginning too we are well aware that anything could go away at any time so it's always like the fear and i think it's good that fear has remained because we feel lucky that we get to do this and we're not exhausted from doing this. Like we feel like we have more to prove. We feel like we've got better songs to write. And, and I think, I think that would be the biggest thing. If there was like a stop in creativity, if we, if we got too stagnant for too long, if, if people weren't enjoying what we we're doing and coming out to shows, if we weren't feeling like reinvigorated to get out there and do the thing, then we would start talking about the end. But I think, you know, we want to go another 20 years. Like the Rolling Stones are still doing it and they're approaching 80. Like, man, like if they're still having a good time doing it, they, those guys clearly don't need the money. You know, maybe we can do that too. 
I, I don't know. I, I mean, if I'm an 80 year old man playing Q without the, I'll be amazed, <laughs> but you know, that anyone still care, but you know, we're, we're, yeah, we don't, we don't talk about the end and, and if it comes, we would, we would all be pretty devastated. But right now I think, you know, it, it's kind of like the band is getting more attention than ever, which is amazing. And, and, and our record label fantasy has been really great working with Tushar Apti producing the record and DJ Bronner doing all the visuals for it. Like, they're they're just such inspiring people to work with so i feel like now you know the end is further away than it's ever been you know like because i didn't i didn't see this kind of revival with what what we're doing right now i didn't didn't see the coming in the way people are responding to the new songs i feel like we're in a really really lucky time for the band that that none of us anticipated so it's a it's a wonderful thing so so yeah i i'm hoping i'm hoping we got a lot more left in the tank i feel that way it's just funny because like the the backside of that question as and I was thinking about it earlier is you know they're kind of and I don't want to say like pe I guess it is just like peaks and, peaks and valleys but thinking about like a lot of like I was saying a lot of my friends have kids some of them are in some are in college so now you know something I enjoy kind of talking about is to, with some my friends that I've known for so long is what is your life going to look like now Cause like, I know what it looked like for my parents. Like as I got older and I understood that my parents were, were our people and they have lives to live and I'm no longer their responsibility on a day to day sense. So it's like, now you kind of get a second bite at your life. What does that look like? And it's such a weird parallel to kind of make, but as you were kind of, as we were talking earlier about your kids and, and the correlation to like, you know, how they, how you've been inspired or whatever. I was also thinking about it for, you know, as, as your kids get older, potentially it's like, well, now we can actually be gone a little bit more. We can tour a little bit more consistently. We could do these things that it's almost again, sort of like an empty nest syndrome type thing, but with the band and thinking yeah. instead of maybe it from an end perspective that it's like, this is almost like a second bite at being young and being able to just kind of do whatever, but that still is a part of the conversation of what does it look like? Like we have to, you have to always be looking forward. So it's like, I just was interested in, in the fact that, that uh, it feels like you were saying, it does feel like a, a resurgence of sorts of, of the band's energy being excited to keep going. But it is also kind of weird when you put them in conjunction to these, here's the, and I hate when these things happen because it makes me feel old where it's like, here's the 20th anniversary of this. Or here's the 10th of this record. And you're like, no, that record came out two, I guess, 10 years ago. Okay. I'm old now. Um, so it's, it's a thing when, when you kind of do that, it, it kind of puts, uh, the perspective of a career on both spectrums on, on like bookending it, where it's like, you have something that you're celebrating that you've done, you're still moving forward, but it's like, okay, what, what is moving forward look like? And are you aware of it? Or do you discuss it? Like, how does it look when you're in it? And so I find that question kind of interesting as people are going through something in a creative sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't, I, you know, yeah, we definitely don't, don't have any any anything kind of planned out for that but it, it is fun to think about and i just you know hope for for more success you know playing playing big venues and stuff and and being able to pick our spots and having really great production and making shows really interesting and and that will be super fun to work on and and you know um and yeah it's just it's just it, it's an enjoyable time and i don't yeah i don't know i don't know what the future looks like but i, I do hope we get to do this for a, a lot longer It'd be, it's funny when you say Rolling Stones, because in my head, I'm like, man, I just, uh, <laughs> it's like uncharted territory. I mean, even with Metallica, I mean, they've been going at it for what, 40 something years. And it's like every yeah. band that still is around doing these things, you're like, well, I mean, they, it's, it's gotta be done soon. Right. And then you're just like, nope. And it's like, they keep pushing it. So it just kind of keeps giving sort of, I guess the barometer for everyone else to go, well, I mean, if that band can do that, why can't we? Yeah. And I just, you know, like, I appreciate those guys passion for it, all of them to, to keep the machine rolling on. And like we saw in some kind of monster, those guys didn't have it the easiest and they, they pushed through no. and they got to, you know, what seems to be a good place and putting out, you know, the, that last record seemed to be pretty cool. I haven't spent that much time with it, but like, it, it seems like they're having a kind of resurgence too. I mean, they've always been the biggest metal band in the world, but like they, 
they they hit on something that that seems to be really working out well for them. So that that's that really inspires me as someone who's not like the biggest Metallica fan. I like what they do, but um, but yeah, they're they're totally inspiring in that level. And like I remember when the Rolling Stones were like the old guys, and they were like my age in the eighties, and and here they are still doing the thing. I'm like, this is this is this is really cool. Like so, yeah, I'm in, man. I'm gonna keep going. So the record comes out in a in about three weeks before, as when we're recording this. Um, absolute last question for you. Do you have a release day? Um, oh, and I just totally blanked on the word now. Um, ritual that you do. <laughs> no, we put out releases so infrequently. I, don't, I didn't happen to have time to build one up. So, uh, so no, I mean, to me, it's going to be a real celebratory time. I'm so happy to finally have this thing out after after all the turmoil just getting here through the pandemic and things and, and not knowing when the record was going to come out and what label it was going to be on and what the songs were going to be like, like just down to who would produce it and stuff. And and all of it uh, was, was a really a dream come true. Everything worked out much better than I had ever anticipated um, when we started working on it. And it's just so nice to have, have this release. And it's been so exciting just putting these songs out and putting these videos out. And now, now the whole thing, we can finally share it with the world. And it's been, it's been so long coming. And I think it's going to be worth the wait for the people that were, were paying attention for as long as they have and who have stuck by us. And we're really grateful for that, to have, to have so many people that have been, have been wanting this and been able to be so patient with us. So, so I'm, I'm so pumped. And uh, I, I, yeah, I think the, the future is pretty bright. Well, looking forward for everyone else to get to hear the record and obviously to get to see you guys again, I would assume it's going to be an A market out the gate. So I'll probably either have to make a trek somewhere or wait until you come to Grand Rapids at some point again and catch another. Set. Oh man, we love Grand Rapids. Our tour manager lives there and uh, he loves it. So we're there. We're there pretty often for days off and stuff. So Grand Rapids is a great spot. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for the time and uh, I'll see you around whenever you guys come back this way. Awesome, John. Thanks for having me. So that was my conversation with Sean Cooper. Want to thank him once again for taking the time. I uh, really enjoy talking with him. Uh, the two times now that he's been on the show, I feel like we have a just a good rapport. I, I enjoy that Sean is willing to kind of uh, be open uh, with some of the more maybe personal questions I asked. You know, it's funny uh, kind of going into something that Sean and I were talking about, like with his kids. Uh, and the fact that someone pointed this out recently, that for someone who admits that they don't want kids, has no interest in kids necessarily, uh, that I bring it up a lot. And sort of like I was saying in the intro, kind of talking about perspective of who you are and uh, how people see you, I just think it's infinitely fascinating to see children uh, become their own like beings. Uh, it is a thing, you know, growing up, living with a, a friend of mine now who has since passed away. Uh, with his kids and watching them grow up from literally being babies to, in some instances, you know, mo like both of his kids that are still around uh, are, I think one of them is probably 20, 21 at this point. And the other one, his uh, youngest was probably about 16, 17 now. Uh, if, I, if I had to venture a guess, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, as I've said several times on this show, too, losing two years essentially to a pandemic kind of completely messes up my brain of like when time has happened and what, what happened and how long and how much time has passed and all that. But uh, it is a thing where the idea of children, um, I guess it's the innocence, honestly. It's, it's the fact that they are so pure and their thoughts are just so kind of out there like not in a bad way of like being out there but like you know like I remember one of my friend's kids we were playing hide and seek and it became a thing where uh, I went to chase him to because we also had a tag element to it I guess and there was a safe space because of course there is and that was the rule he made up on the spot and he went to run back to his room and uh, he was like oh watch out for my toys and so I made the comment I was like well you know if you picked up your toys you wouldn't have to worry about people stepping on them or losing any parts or anything like that uh, maybe it would be advantageous for you to pick them up. And I remember him just looking at the ground and kind of staring at me and then just was like, well, no, I don't, I only have to pick them up before I go home, like leaving his, his dad's house. And I just kind of was like, I mean, that's, that's not wrong logic. Like you do technically only have to pick them up before you go, uh, which is another day away. So why, why, why? work now when you can enjoy and play 
and just push all that shit, responsibility and so forth, off to the end. And you're still within the realm of when you had to do something. Um, and I know that's not like the greatest example, but there are so many examples I've seen of, of watching kids kind of start thinking for themselves and kind of formulating their own ideas and the experiences they have and how they're able to articulate them and how it basically is building them to be who they will be and shaping them. And to me, I feel like it would be very interesting to grow up in a family where your, your, your parent is a touring musician and I'm sure it's hard to be away for a long time, but when they get to hit a certain age, I feel like it's like, what does it look like? What does it do for them? Like, I feel like so often, you know, we we see parents talking about how they want the best for their kids and all the opportunities and advantages that, that they didn't get growing up and so forth. And to me, I just wonder when you have a parent of yours who is living out their childhood dream of this thing that not everyone gets to do, does it inspire them? Does it make, does it give permission, I guess, for lack of a better term, to maybe think that the quote unquote impossible is not impossible, that it is very feasible. Um, and from that perspective, I, I just can't help but ask questions about people. It sounds terrible to say it like this, but people's children, because I, I just, the wonderment and the authenticity of, of children, I guess the, the innocence of children, uh, I just find fascinating to, to try to experience that part of my life that maybe is, is gone. Um, and maybe I guess that's where, where I come from at it. Um, but I, I do have people that have reached out and be like, you ask an awful lot about children's perspectives, uh, of people's kids based on the fact that you don't want any. And I was like, uh, you know, there's a little bit of truth to that, but, uh, in a non less creepy way, here's, here's kind of my mentality of why. But again, it sort of all circles back to what I was saying in the intro, which is I just try to take life in from as many different vantage points as I possibly can to make an informed, better decision on my own life. Um, this is the only one, as far as we know, that that we got. So why not try to live it to the fullest? Um, and I think that's something that Sean has done. I, I think that's something that everyone uh, in Take It Back Sunday crew is is been doing. I mean, I think that was the interesting thing about Soul, Sold, Sold, uh, the video and the the idea for it uh, was just kind of going back and recapturing, you know, the fun of before everything became the career or whatever. And it was just we played music in front of people because we enjoy it. Uh, it wasn't a career or anything like that. So I uh, really want to thank Sean once again for uh, taking the time to chat. And uh, I'm going to start wrapping up this episode because I've been yammering on for a handful of minutes now. And I'm sure you're like, shut the fuck up and get this thing over with <laughs> if you're still listening. Uh, if you are, thank you so much. Uh, always appreciate the people that have been reaching out. I've been getting a lot of comments lately. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, if you would like to keep up with Taking Back Sunday, uh, you can just go to takingbacksunday.com. That'll be your landing page for everything with the band, tour dates and all that. They are on tour right now. Uh, so go catch them if you are able to. Uh, if you would like to keep up with them on Facebook, it's Taking Back Sunday, Instagram at Taking Back Sunday, and Twitter at TBS Official. If you'd like to keep up with Sean, you can find him on Instagram and Twitter at Sean W. Cooper. Uh, everything is in the show notes below, so peep that if you can't remember any of this. Uh, if you'd like to keep up with the podcast, simple enough. Uh, Bruce Speak Pod on all your major social media platforms. Uh, not uh, technically on TikTok, but not on TikTok at the same time. I don't use it. I haven't had the app in over a year or more. Um, so it is what it is. Uh, if you'd like to keep on the conversation with something from this episode or any of the past ones, you can email me at brutallyspeaking at gmail.com. You can DM me. You can comment on something. Uh, and like I said, keep the conversation going. Uh, don't feel weird uh, sending me, like even calling out the thing, like I said, like the children thing. Uh the person was like, I don't mean to be a dick about this. I just, you know, why do you ask this when it's clear you don't want kids? Uh, and I kind of had to take a moment to, to articulate that and figure that out. But um, I appreciated the the person reaching out and we had kind of an interesting conversation more about just, like I said, the, the way that we think and watching people grow and becoming people from children to their own kind of being. Uh, it's very interesting, uh, the brain and how we all kind of come to be. Um, all of that said, would like to also thank my podcast sponsors, Rockabilia. Uh, want to thank them so much for all their continued, uh, support. Uh, Frankie and I have had many a long conversation in person on the phone, emails, texts, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, has grown to be one of my great friends that I've made doing this show. So, uh, shout out to Rockabilia. 
Use our code uh, brutally at checkout. Take 10% off your total order. Uh, Rockabilly is killing it right now. Holidays are right around the corner. So go pick something up for you or a loved one and save some money while you're at it. Kind of shows that you're supporting the show and Rockabilly. That's a win-win uh, in my book. Uh, Starving Artist. Uh, check out their beers over at starvingartist.beer. Uh, head on over to their socials. Uh, usually tag them everywhere. So if you see them, tag them. Go check them out. They're working on some lovely beers. Uh, they are closed for the season, but... Uh, some new goodness is on the way, and boy, that place makes some delicious fucking beer. So if you're ever in the uh, the area, um, go check them out. I guarantee you, you will enjoy at least half of the menu. <laughs> I know everything I drank, I enjoyed the shit out of. Uh, so take that for what it's worth. And for the Brutally Speaking Podcast, I am John, and I will see you all next week. Where my guest, Brent fucking Hines of Mastodon. It's a short one. But it's a good one. Um, Definitely really enjoyed the short conversation. Uh, So I will see you all next week. Enjoy the rest of your week. I'll talk to you then.